He said, Daryl Snore Snor sold out. I just sat up and watched him all night. The next night, it was a different guy's turn. In the morning, the same thing. Harold Stall stand up, bloodshot eyes. They said, man, what happened to you? You look awful. He said, man, that Daryl shakes the root. I sat up and watched him all night. The third night was Frank's turn. Frank was a big birdie ex-football player, a man's man. The next morning, he came to breakfast, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Good morning, he said. They couldn't believe it. They said, man, what happened? He said, well, we got ready for bed. I went and tucked Daryl in the bed and kissed him good night. So he stood up all night and watched me. <laughs> Pick on Daryl time, baby. <laughs> all right, last one. After being put to bed, a boy calls to his father from his room. Dad, will you bring me a glass of water? The father was already in bed himself, so he answered the boy would be, that the boy would be fine as you go back to bed. That was about five minutes called, and the boy called out again, asking for water. The father replied in the same way. After another five minutes, the boy called out again with the same request. The father was getting annoyed, and he replied back, No, you're fine. Go to sleep. If you ask again, I'm going to come in there and spank you. There was about a ten-minute call this time before the boy called out again. Dad, when you come in here and spank me, will you bring me a glass of water? <laughs> Church of Genesis chapter 45, verse 1, we'll go through 28, and we'll read this to you from the Living Translation. So Joseph, Joseph could stand it no longer. How of all of you, he cried out to his attendants, and he was left alone with his brother. Then he wept aloud, and his sobs could be heard throughout the palace, and the news was quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brother. Is my father still alive? But his brothers couldn't say a word. They were so stunned with surprise. Come over here, he said, so they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But don't be angry with yourself that you did this to me, for God did it. He sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. These two years of famine will grow to seven, during which there will be neither plying nor harvest. God has sent me here to keep you and your families alive, so that you will become a great nation. Yes, it was God who sent me here, and not you. And he has made me a counselor to Pharaoh, and manager of this entire nation, ruler of all the land of Egypt. Hurry, return to my father and tell him. Your son Joseph said, God has made him chief of all the land of Egypt. Come down to me right away. You shall live in the land of Goshen so that you can be near me with all your children, your grandchildren, your flocks, and your herds, and all that you have. I will take care of you there. You men are witnesses of my promise, and my brother Benjamin has heard me say it. For there are still five years of famine ahead of us. Otherwise, you will come to utter poverty along with all your household. Tell your father about all my power here in Egypt and how everyone obeys me and bring me, bring him to me quickly. Then weeping with joy, he embraced Benjamin, and Benjamin began to weep too. And he did the same with each of his brothers who finally found their tongue. The news soon reached Pharaoh. Joseph's brothers had come, and Pharaoh was very happy to hear it as, it, as, as were his officials. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Tell your brothers to load their pack animals and return quickly to their homes in Canaan. And to bring your father and all your families and come to here to Egypt to live. Tell them Pharaoh will assign you the very best territory in the land of Egypt. You shall live off the fat of the land. And tell your brothers to take wagon, wagons from Egypt to carry their wives and their little ones to bring your father here. Don't worry about your property, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. So J Joseph gave them wagons and Pharaoh commanded and provisions for the journey. And gave each of them new clothes, but to Benjamin he gave five changes of clothes and 300 pieces of silver. He sent his father 10 donkey loads of the good things of Egypt, and 10 donkeys loaded with grain and all kinds of other food to eat on his journey. So he, his brothers went off. Don't quarrel along the way, was his parting shot, and leaving they returned to the land of Canaan to Jacob their father. Joseph is alive, they shouted at him, and he's ruler over all the land of Egypt. But Jacob's heart was like a stone. He couldn't take it in. But when they had given him Joseph's messages, and when he saw the wagons filled with food that Joseph had sent him, his spirit revived. And he said, it must be true. Joseph, my son, is alive. I will go and see him before I die. Church, this morning, we're going to face some truths. The Bible says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Amen. Now, it didn't say it's just going to set you free. It said it's going to make you free. As you realize the truth, as you hear the truth, and you apply it to your life, then 
That truth is going to set you free from the bondages and things that's been holding you back and holding you down. Yes. Amen? Amen. My question this morning, do you know why you were born? The Bible says, we were just talking about this morning, the Bible says we are here to glorify God. That's our mission in life, is to glory, bring glory to Him. Next question, do you know who you are? Oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, hoping I make heaven by the skin of my teeth. That's not who you are. You are the righteousness of Christ. Amen. 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 Not righteous because of anything that you and I can do. Amen. All because of what he did and our faith is in him. And thank God it's not in us. Amen. 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 Next question, are you willing to wait for God? Well, all he don't take too long. <laughs> Most of us, amen. amen. Next question, how big is your God? Amen. Our God's a way maker. Way how big is your God? Way bigger. Next question, are you willing to face your past? Ooh, yes, I have. Now we come to the question, do you want to be set free? Hey, come yeah. on. Some people do. They want to change. A lot of you are here this morning because you want to hear some truth. You want to hear some words that will change your life, that change your circumstances, change the situation. But most of all, change your heart. Amen. Because yes. God has to change our heart and enable us for Him to do the things that He wants to do in our life. Amen. Amen. And I said some people want to change. Some don't want to do what it takes to get through. They really stay in bondage. They'll allow them to do what is necessary for God to set them free from whatever bondage they're in. And then there are other people they really do. They want out of bondage. They're tired of things holding them down, holding them back. They want to be all that God wants them to be. They want to do all that God wants them to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Listen, the hardest truth that you'll ever faith is the truth about yourself. Amen. Amen. You know, we don't want to have no problem seeing everybody else's faults. We look at everybody else's fault through a magnifying glass. Exactly. But when it comes to us, we look through rose-colored glasses, don't exactly. we? Amen. <laughs> Most of us do whatever we can to keep from facing the hard truth about ourselves. It's always easier to pretend to play games. And it's never easy to come to grip with your failures. Listen, we all fail. We all make mistakes. We all stumble. If you fail, you fall down, guess what? You're part of the human race. Just don't give up. As long as you fail and you keep getting back up, God's going to help you. He's going to help you. But if you choose to stay there, God will let you stay there. Amen. Truth, rightly told, ultimately leads me to God who is true. God does not lie. No liar can stand in his presence, according to Revelation 21 8. And since that verse in Revelation Speaks of liars going to the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. The stakes are high. Amen? And after being in ministry for many years, I have concluded that the first step in solving personal problems is having the courage to tell the truth. Amen. When I read counsel with couples, when they come in my office, we always tell them, everything that's said in here stays in here. But you have to be truthful in order for us to help them. Exactly. And you can't take what the other person saying offensively personally, because you've got to dig things out sometimes to get to the root of what's causing the problem. So you don't tell the truth, you can't help it. Amen? The people who dare to tell the truth about themselves are the people who begin to get better. Is it painful? Yes. You bet. Sometimes we don't like to hear the truth about us. Is it scary? Of course. Is it easy? No way. But those people who will swallow their fear, endure the pain, and decide to take the hard road of truth are the ones who get better. As long as you make excuses, as long as you keep lying to yourself, nothing's ever going to change. You're going to keep on going around that mountain, around that mountain, around that mountain. Amen? 
I have seen marriages saved by tell people telling the truth. And I've also seen marriage crumble because of deception. A friend of me, a friend of mine came in with a serious personal problem. He didn't cover up the truth and he didn't try to blame anyone else for his own stupidity. He simply and honestly told the truth. And when our session was over, I said to him, you were 90% on the way home. The hardest part was deciding to tell the truth. Why don't we get better, church? My pastor said, I learned this truth when I visited a Christian counselor during a hard time in my life. A few days after meeting with him, I received a packet of material in the mail. On one of the sheets, he had done a takeoff on the word of Jesus in John 8, 32. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But the counselor added this phrase. The truth will make you free, but it's going to hurt you first. And when I read that, he said, when I read that, a light went off in my head, and I saw myself in a brand new way. I wasn't getting better because I didn't want the truth to hurt me first. It was easier to avoid the truth because the truth about my life, my own life, was too painful to bear. I realize why most people have trouble growing spiritually. It's not because we don't know the truth. We've got so much truth that's running out our eyeballs. We hear the truth at church, on the radio, on the internet, from our friends, and books, and CDs, and seminars, and concerts. And we get it straight from the Bible. But the problem is much deeper than that, church. We know the truth, but we don't want to let it hurt us, so we deflect it, we ignore it, we deny it, we attack it, or we argue with it. Any way we can to avoid that truth. Our approach is like a spaceship being attacked by aliens. We put up this force field so we can deflect the incoming salvos of truth. And after a while, we get so good at deflection that the truth never gets through to us at all. And that's why we're still angry. That's why we're still stubborn. We're still bitter. We're still greedy. We're still arrogant. We're still filled with love. We're still self-willed. We're still unkind. When you're finally willing to be hurt by the truth about yourself, you're going to be set free. Amen. 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 I'm going to get back to Joseph. Most of you know the story. Joseph's brothers were jealous of him. So they were going to kill him. Instead, they decided to put him in a pit. And then they sold him to some uh, slave traders that came along. And he went to Egypt. And God, oh, but he kept his heart right. You know, most of us, we'd be so bitter. My brother sold me into slavery. And we'd be so bitter, we'd be so hard-hearted that we'd not have any way we won't ever forgive them. But they sold him in. And because he kept his heart right, because he had the favor of God on his life, he was promoted everywhere he went until finally he was second in command of all of Egypt. And the brothers had come to him once before, and here they come the second time to get some grain. And this time then he made them bring their little youngest brother, Benjamin, with them. And he wanted to see if they'd changed, if they would abandon Benjamin like they abandoned him. A great feast was underway at Joseph's house. And for the first time in 20 years, all 12 brothers were together. And Genesis 43, 34 says they drank and were merry with him. Another translation said they celebrated and drank freely until everyone was quite relaxed. That means exactly what it sounds like. Plenty of food, plenty of drink, much to celebrate. Everybody was happy, happy, happy. But what about Joseph? The brothers all thought he was dead. Boy, are they going to be in for a big surprise. They're about to be set free from their guilty past. See, they've been carrying this all their life. What they've done to their brother. And behind Joseph, is God who orchestrated all of it. The Bible says all things work together for good to those who are called according to his promise. Amen. We forget that last part. He had a purpose for Joseph's life. Amen. And everywhere Joseph went, God caused him to find favor. And God got, got him right where he wanted him to be so when the brothers came, he could save their lives too. And he told the brothers that. And the truth is about to set them free, but it's going to hurt them first. Three words tell us how it happened. Number one, confession. 
The banquet's over now. It's time for the brothers to go back to Canaan. And before the brothers leave, Joseph has his steward hide a silver cup in a bag belonging to Benjamin, the youngest brother. And the brothers leave, and he sends the steward to stop them and accuse them of stealing the silver cup. The brothers deny the accusation with the promise that if any man has found that silver cup, he will die. Of course, the steward found the cup right where he put it in Benjamin's bag. But it was never Joseph's plan to kill Benjamin. He wants to find out, like I said, if they're going to abandon Benjamin the way they abandoned him. Were they the same men or had they really changed? And no wonder the brothers were terrified. How could this have happened after such a having a happy banquet? What will happen when they get back to Joseph's house? Will they be thrown in jail? Will they be killed? In every story there comes a moment of truth when the truth has to come out. Now the truth comes from Judah. Speaking for all his brothers, he admits their guilt. He says in Genesis 44, 16, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Here at last is what Joseph was waiting for. Not just the admission of guilt, but an acknowledgement of God. I want you to listen to this. Years ago, a counselor told me something. He said to his clients, you're only as sick as your secrets. Amen. Then he added this. If you've got a lot of secrets, you're really sick. Wow. Secrets have a way of festering on the inside until we are so sick and we don't know why or what to do about it. If you've been hiding some dark part of your past because you can't bear to deal with it, you're sicker than you think. At some point, you've got to come clean and confess it to God if you want to get better. As long as you hold it on the inside, it's going to eat away at you and eat away at you. But you take it to God and you confess it to Him. I didn't say you have to confess it to people. Sometimes it's better that people don't know something. Amen. 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 But sometimes, listen, as Christians, we should be able to confess our faults one to another. That's what the Bible says, do. But the sad thing is, not everybody would be the good Christian. Exactly. When you start confessing your faults, exactly. all of a sudden they're going to run their mouth and tell their exactly. lying town about it. Exactly. Yeah. Amen? Amen. These brothers have been sick with the guilt of sin for a long time. And keeping it secret has kept them in bondage of fear for many years. Number two, repentance. Judah makes this long individual speech. In the book of Genesis. And he pleads that they be allowed to take Benjamin back home to Canaan. And at the end, Judah offers himself as a replacement for Benjamin. Please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant for my Lord. And let the boy go back with his brothers. This was a loyalty test. Do you love your brother more than yourself? In the old days, the brothers would have abandoned Benjamin and left him as a slave in Egypt. But they have changed. If there's anything wrong with this world, and there's a lot wrong with this world, one thing is, when do you ever get forgiven? If you've done something, and you've really honestly changed and made good of, on your life, when do people ever forgive you? In this world, they don't. You can do something, there's a pastor now going through something he did 35 years ago. Had an outstanding ministry, reaching people worldwide. Repented, went through restoration, did all those things. But it still wasn't enough. He had to step down from his church. All of us in here, we've got things in our closet, skeletons in our closet, things Absolutely. we've done that we're not proud of. That's right. But we've asked God to forgive us. We've tried to make amends and do the right things since then. Amen. When are we going to be forgiven? They were not going to leave Benjamin in Egypt. They're not going to abandon Benjamin in his hour of need. Grace has done a deep work in them, and they're about to be set free. Number three is reconciliation. Joseph doesn't need to hear anything else. The time has come for him to reveal himself. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He said, make everyone go out for me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud. 
so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Dismayed at one word, shocked to call me another. Yes. Dumbfounded and terrified, too. Confused, astonished. Last time they saw him, man, he was bitch. That's 20 something years ago. Amen? It doesn't make you stop and think. What would it take to convince you that someone you thought was dead was actually alive? Especially somebody like Joseph. Last time they saw him 22 years ago when they sold him to the desert nomads. Now he's the prime minister of Egypt. What's that old saying? What the devil meant for bad? God turned around and called it. Amen. 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 Absolutely. Amen. Amen. Listen, I don't think that I do. I think that would kind of give you the shakes, the shivers, and the heebie jeebies. I don't think I'd be able to say anything either. What exactly could you say in a moment like that? Uh, Joseph, uh, brother, no hard feelings, right? It was just a joke. We're cool, right? <clears throat> Here's the, the, the kicker there were no hard feelings. That's the most amazing part. No hard feelings. And all the time says, oh, I forgive you. But every time that person comes around, something rises up inside you. And you know, you really haven't forgiven. You said it, but you really haven't forgiven them from the heart. Yeah. But here, after all they did, sell him into slavery, first we're going to kill him, sell him into slavery, all that they'd done to him, and yet there were no hard feelings. I said, some of them have a hard time with that. But you don't know what they've done. Listen, look what they've done to him. Look what you and I have done to Jesus. Wow. Amen. No reincriminations. No getting even. Most of us, if somebody hurts us, we're going to hurt them worse than they hurt us. Amen. Amen. No threats. He completely let his guilty brothers off the hook. Think about that. Listen, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God is forgiving the inexcusable in you. Unforgiveness is choosing to stay trapped in a jail cell of bitterness serving time for somebody else's crime. When boiled down to its essence, unforgiveness is hatred. You're holding unforgiveness. I've said this so many times, church. And, and the reason I'm preaching on that, time is short. And there's more Christians sitting in the church houses today. They're not drunks. They're not addicts. They don't have this. But they are full of unforgiveness. And because there's something that's on the inside that you don't see on the outside, then they think they're okay. But it's time, church, that we need to get right with God because God is coming back and He's coming back soon. Still, he says five things to his brothers. Come near to me. I think if I was one of the brothers, I'd be in the back of the pack on that one. <laughs> Number two, I'm Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. He's not denying what they did. Listen, you don't deny what that person has done to you. What you're saying is, I choose to love my God and do what he asked me to do over my feelings over what somebody has done to me. Amen. Amen. Yes. Three, do not be distressed or angry with yourself because you sold me here. Four, God sent me before you to preserve life. That's amazing, church. He goes on to explain the years of famine how God wanted to preserve their family. Number five, hurry up and go to my father. Go tell dad I'm still alive and bring him to Egypt. Move the whole family here. I got a place picked out. Listen. He wanted his brother to go back and tell his dad what he had achieved. Every son wants to know that his father is proud of him. Every son. So Joseph says, go back and tell my father about all my glory. Even the prime minister of Egypt was just his father's son in the end. 
after all the pain, the sorrow, and the sadness, after rising to the pinnacle of human achievement, after becoming the second most powerful man in the world, after all that, this was number one in Joseph's heart. Tell my father about my boy. Every child wants to know, Dad, are you proud of me? My dad was not an individual that showed a lot of emotion. He didn't pass out a lot of compliments. But one time he, we were sitting and we were talking and carrying conversation. And he said, Roger, and this was a compliment coming from him. He says, you're the only kid I've got that hasn't asked me for anything. That may not mean much to you, but that meant a lot to me because of the way my dad was. He was a man's man. Every child, every son wants to know. And dads, make sure your kids know the answer to that question. If all you do is go around and say negative things to them and scold them and get on them and do them all the time, then you're going to drop them away from you. When I used to punish my kids, and I only had to do it a couple of times, when I punished my kids, then I'd turn around and tell them why I did it and tell them I love you. My dad, my dad used to whip us and he'd tell you, uh, this is going to hurt you, hurt me more, it's going to hurt you. I never believed that. Really? <laughs> his first word about his father is hurry. His last word about his father is hurry. And finally comes the moment when Joseph and his brother reunite. It says, he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. I want you to notice that phrase, all his brothers. This includes Simeon, Reuben, Judah, and all the rest who conspired to kidnap and sell him as a slave. They were all kissed and wept over by forgiving Joseph. What they had done was unforgivable, yet he forgave them. This is no greater picture of the Bible of the forgiving love of Christ. All that we've done, all that we don't deserve, all the things that should happen to us, He forgives us. Yes, amen. And Christ, He said, Christ said, if you want to know people, the world to know that you're my disciples, it's the love you show one to another. Yes. If we've got Christ in this church, then we should have the love of Christ coming out of us. It's only after that that they talked to him. His love overcame their shame. God's love overcomes our shame. Thus welcomed by Joseph, they became a family and true brothers for the first time. In chapter 45, the brothers go back home and they inform Jacob, who nearly died on the spot, that Joseph was still alive. When they said Joseph is still alive, he's ruler over all the land of Egypt. That sounded incredible. No wonder Jacob nearly had a heart attack. For 22 years, he believed his beloved son was dead. Now he found out he was basically running the show in Egypt. First it was shocking, then it was frightening. Then it would cause him to ask some hard questions. What really happened to Joseph? How could you have sold your brother as a slave? Who was behind this? And why did you lie to me? All that raises a question. How did these boys manage to explain all this to their father? Well, Dad, you see, uh, we were just mad at him, so we threw him in a pit, but we weren't going to kill him. We were just going to scare him. That wasn't true. But you can imagine the brothers say that. Then, then along come these traitors, and they offered to buy him, so we sold him. We're really sorry about that. And we're sorry about that coat of many colors that we dipped in blood. We shouldn't have lied to you. No matter how you spin it, there is no acceptable explanation. Nothing could cover up for their hatred, their envy, their conspiracy, and their treachery. And maybe Jacob was so overjoyed that he was willing to overlook their lying and scheming. The chapter ends with Jacob saying, My son is alive. I must go to him and see him before I die. So he does. In chapter 46, he moves to Egypt and reunited with Joseph. He's then 130 years old. In chapter 47, he meets Pharaoh and the whole family settles in Goshen where they prosper. 
Jacob lives another 17 years. In chapter 48, as he's near death, he calls for his grandson, Manasseh, and Ephraim, and blesses them. In chapter 49, Jacob calls for his sons and pronounces a blessing on them. They will become the 12 tribes of Israel. What Joseph did, what God did, put Joseph where he was, he saved the forefathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. Had he not done what God told him to do, that would never ever happen. Amen. Amen. He dies at the age of 147 with his family gathered around him. Then in chapter 50, Joseph leads a funeral procession from Egypt to Canaan where he bears his father. The, the sovereign God accomplished his purposes for Jacob, Joseph, and for his brothers. Listen, the word says God has a plan for you. He said, I have a future and a hope for you. Find out what God's plan is. We're always trying to ask, oh God, I need you to bless this and bless that. Find out what his plan is. It's already blessed, church. Exactly. Listen, he knows the beginning from the end. And he's got a plan. And sometimes when we're going in the right direction, we're doing what the Holy Spirit's telling us to do, and then all of a sudden we get a good idea. Not a God idea, but a good idea. And we have to veer off this direction, or we veer off on this direction, and then God, because he loves us, will chastise you. That means child train. Okay? When you see your child going down a direction that's going to hurt them, you do everything in your power to keep that from happening. Well, that's what God does with it, because he loves us. And he'll do whatever it takes to get us back on the path that we need to be so we can be at the place we need to be so that he can bless us. Church, there's so many people missing their blessing because they're not where God wants them to be so that he can bless them where they are. Like the, the brewer who was a leper. God, you can bless me over here. I don't have to go over there. I don't have to dip in that dirty water. You can bless me right now. God has a purpose, church. He could have done what he wanted to do about Joseph. He's God. But he had to go through all those things because he was working on Joseph part two. Because when your brothers come and bow down before you, you have the power to kill every one of them for what they did to you. You need a heart change. Otherwise, that will happen. Amen. Amen. But because his heart was changed, he didn't hold anything against him, and he forgave them all completely. For the next four centuries, the Jews will live in Egypt, first in prosperity, then in slaves, when Pharaoh arose who did not know about Joseph. In latter times, a mighty deliverer named Moses will arise and lead the people out of Egypt. Almost, listen, almost 1,800 years later, a baby will be born who will be called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. His name is Jesus. Amen. And this is how the New Testament begins. The book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. I want you to notice, Joseph, who's a real hero of the story, doesn't even get mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. He simply included one of the brothers of Judah. And if you study Genesis closely, you'll see that Judah's history is checkered, to say the least. On one side of the ledger, you have the fact that Judah was the one who said, let's make some money by selling Joseph to the Midianites. But you also have a sordid affair with Tamar in Genesis 38. And on the plus side, Judah makes this impassioned speech in Genesis 44, pleading that Benjamin not be left behind. That was the final proof to Joseph that his brothers had truly repented. One might think the Messiah would come from the line of Joseph and not from Judah. But to think that way shows how little we understand the grace of God. Jesus comes from the loins of a very fallible, fallen man who was capable of great cruelty and great compassion. In other words, he was just like most of us. Amen. If we were writing the script, Jesus would have come from Joseph. But when God writes the script, he puts Jesus in Judah's family tree. Now I ask you again this morning. How much of all this did Joseph understand when he was thrown in the pit? None. 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 Sometimes God will tell you to do something you know, well, you want God to explain it to. God don't have to explain it to his church. He's looking for obedience. He's looking for faith. That means you can't always see it, understand it, but you're going to do it because you're trusting him. Amen. Amen. Yes. God knew it all and he saw it all. 
Joseph was a great man. He served a great God. The rest of the story could not, not unfold until these brothers were set free. I stand there reading that. God used Joseph to bring about a miracle of healing that would one day result in a Savior being born in Bethlehem. One final word, I'm done. We need, all need to be set free as Joseph's brothers were set free. And the path to freedom is the same for us as it was for them. If you're willing to face the truth about our sin and our disobedience, if you're willing to confess and repent of your sins, if you'll give up your anger and your excuses, then at last, we'll be set free to love one another the way God wants us to love one another. Listen, God will not ask you what model car you use. He'll ask how many people you have taken. Amen. God will not ask you your square meter for your house. He'll ask you how many people you got in. God won't ask you for a clothing brand in your closet. He'll ask you how many people you helped dress up. God won't ask you about how high your salary was. He'll ask you if you earned it clean. God won't ask you about what your title was. He'll ask you if you did your job in the best of your ability. God won't ask you how many friends you had. He will ask you how many people you consider considered you as their friend. God will not ask you which area you lived in. He'll ask you how you treated your neighbors. God will not ask you about the color of your skin. He'll ask you about the purity of your interior. God will not ask you why it took so long to seek salvation. He will take you with love to his home in heaven, not to the gates of hell. God won't ask you how many people you shared this message. He'll simply ask if you were embarrassed to do so. Jesus Christ said, if you deny me before friends, I will deny you before my friends. Amen. 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 So we want to ask this question one more time. Do you want to be set free? Yes. Yeah. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we don't have to be perfect to come to you. If we had to be perfect, who among us would fall out? They call you the friend of sinners. Thank you, God, it's true. You are the friend, and we are the sinners. Thank you for the truth that makes us free. Teach us to love as you have loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God praise and glory. <laughs> Church, I'm going to read this. Sister Charlene wrote this. Sister Charlene, just wave at everybody. Sister Charlene, just wait there right there, okay? She wrote this, and I, I thought it was awesome. I want to share this with you. Then we're going to play a, a song. I want you to stay. The altars will be open. If you need to come and make things right between you and God, if you need to confess some things to God, then I want you to do that. But this is what it says. Don't ever give up on yourself. Don't ever give up on others. God loves you, and he wants you to know him. He is forever loving Heavenly Father. Does not give up on the human race, even though against the first man rebelled. He wants to extend his mercy and grace. And he does not want anyone to go to hell. We've all sinned and come short of the glory that God has given. He wants us to accept new life in Jesus the Lord. So we'll live in victory now and forever in heaven. And he can help you to help others. There is no other solid foundation to stand. So do not give up. Just give it all to God. And he will show you the beautiful plan that he has for your life. So God bless you and don't ever give up. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and play that video.